Hello and namaste everyone from the Grey Medicals. Hope you all are doing well. We are currently facing a pandemic and amidst the tough and unproductive times, we, the medical students from different medical colleges of Nepal, have created a platform where we can learn and grow together as medical students. Grey is the color that symbolizes the transition between black and white. From knowing nothing, we are at the transition to knowing something. Hence, we have chosen the name The Grey Medicos. The Grey Medicos organizes interactive teacher-student sessions guiding novice medical students through the clinical approach to various diseases. Our session's main aim is to make medical students learn the art of history taking to reach a proper clinical diagnosis. We explore the boundless world of medical sciences through a student's eye and try to provide the learners with a clear basic concept and explain the simple reasons behind every clinical step. These guided sessions also prepares us for those questions which are asked in our Viva and furthermore other limitless questions that can arise anytime during our clinical practices. We believe our sessions can establish a bond between the learners and the presenters and also encourage our learners to come forward and step up for presenting on various topics as it will open doors to limitless benefits. So, join us in studying together as a team and help us to raise this platform to the next level. Journey to be the better doctors, the Grey Medicos, thank you very much. Good evening everyone, warm welcome to you all. Grey is the transitional color between grey and white. We medical students are in the transition of knowing something and not knowing something. This is the reason we have this platform, the Grey Medicals, where our knowledge reaches endeavors with the help of teachers and our seniors. For today's session, we have Mr. Sagar Panta, a third year medical student from UCMS, talking about him. He is very laborious and hardworking, motivated student, and one of the most loved person of UCMS. For today's session, we have... Uh, oh, Sagar Pantadai, and he'll be helping us for getting a detailed concept of the female reproductive organ. This will be a basic concept for the upcoming session on Saturday, where the clinical aspect of gynecology will be studied uh, with Dr. Manoj Lamsal, Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics, and Jamuna Malladevi, who is a final year medical student from UCMS. The rules for the program are, chat will be off throughout the session. Any queries will be taken at the main webinar. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over the mic to Mr. Sagar Panta. Thank you, Bhai. Mm. Am I audible? Okay. Uh, I welcome all of you to the presentation session of the Gray Medicals. Uh, today, the topic of discussion is female reproductive system. And without any delay, let's start. Either. Okay, so here we have. Female reproductive system. Let's start it off with the embryology. My basic understanding of uh, the sex of the baby was that if a child is born with XX chromosome, then he or the baby will be a female. And if the baby is born with XY chromosome, then that baby would be a boy. But it, it's not that simple. There is a lot more going uh, other than that. What determines the sex or the gonads of the baby is not just the mere presence of two X chromosome. We have a case here, a teenager with short stature and horse kidney, for some reason undergo karyotyping. The karyotyping results showed that the teenager had only 45 chromosomes. What is the sex of this teenager? Uh, this teenager had the monosomy of sex chromosome that's possibly likely to be a Turner syndrome. He has only one X chromosome and not another X or another Y chromosome. So if XX makes female and XY makes male, then this person has only X chromosome. What will be the sex of this teenager? 
let's uh, we'll uh, come back to finding the answer of this question at the end of the embryology. So let's start it off with the embryology. How are the gonads developed? Uh, in the earlier stages, in the earlier life, the male and female gonads are initially identical. What I mean by that is the gonads are undifferentiated. The gonad can either be a testis or ovaries based on uh, the chromosomes that are fertilized at the time of fertilization. If the uh, zygote has the Y chromosomes from the father, then the Y chromosome contains SRYzine, which contains the testis determining factor that leads to the induction of that gonads into testis. If that Y chromosome is absent, then we are all we are uh, always programmed to become a female. What I mean to say this is a girl or a baby is not a female because she has two X chromosome, but because she has no Y chromosome. So the presence of Y chromosome makes a baby go to a male, and the absence of Y chromosome leads to the induction of that undifferentiated gonads into ovary. So that was about the gonads. And what develops the internal genitalia? The internal genitalia of the female includes organs like fallopian tube, uterus, and upper one third of the vagina. The lower one third of the vagina uh, is derived from different structure, what we call uh, urogenital sinus. We'll talk about urogenital sinus uh, later, but the, uh, the structure that gives rise to the internal genital tract of female uh, is something that's called mullerian duct or paramesonectric duct. So what's paramesonectric duct? Paramesonectric duct, that means the duct that's near the mesonectric duct. And what's the mesonectric duct? That's the duct that's associated with mesonephrus. Mesonephrus is the interim kidney that uh, helps in our embryonic life. Later, our kidney, adult kidney is derived from metanephrus, but, me but mesonephrus is the interim kidney uh, in the embryonic life, and the duct associated with mesonep uh, mesonephrus is the mesonectric duct. And we have another duct in the near or side of uh, mesonephric duct, that's paramesonephric duct. And the paramesonephric duct gives rise to fallopian tube, uterus, and upper one third of the vagina. And the development of female internal genitalia uh, occur uh, in the absence of mullering inhibiting factor and androgens. What I mean to say by this is that, as we already discussed, if there is no Y chromosome, then we're always programmed to be a female. So that means if person has Y chromosome, he will of course develop testis, but in addition to that, the testis will secrete testosterone, the hydrotestosterone that will help uh, in the development of male external and internal genital tract. But in addition to that, he has to turn off the program that uh, will lead to the development of fallopian tube uterus or upper one third of the vagina. If for some reason he did not turn off that program, if that program is not turned off, then he will have male internal genital tract like seminal vesicles, um, epididymis these structures, but you will also have fallopian tube and uterus. So this programming of being a female has to be turned off. And what turned off this uh, program is the anti mullerian hormone or the mullerian inhibiting factor that's secreted by the testis itself. So if Y chromosome is not present, the testis won't be present and the mullerian inhibiting factor won't be produced. Mullerian duct will persist and the mullerian duct will give rise to these structures like fallopian tube, uterus and upper one third of the vagina. And the external genitalia arises from the structures like urogenital sinus, urogenital folds, genital tubercle, labiscrotal swelling. We'll talk about what these structures are later. So here we have a picture. What this shows is here, let's, uh, okay, follow the cursor. So we have kidney here. The adult kidney develops from metanephrus. But uh, before metanephrus, uh, pronephrus and mesonephrus act as the interim kidney. And in the adult life, our adult kidney is derived from metanephrus. The mesonephrus, the duct associated with this mesonephrus is called the mesonephric duct. We have mesonephric duct here. So mesonephric duct, this mesonephric duct is responsible for the induction of male internal genital tract. Whereas in female, what gives rise to female internal genital tract is the paramesonephric duct. That's the duct uh, which is near to the mesonephric duct. We'll see that in the next picture. Uh, this is also the same structure. We have kidney, pro, um, interim kidney, that's mesonephrus. And in the early life, our gonads were in close proximity to the kidney. So here is pro, uh, mesonephrus, and we have the gonadal ovaries, gonads, undifferentiated gonads. It can either be testis or ovaries. If it is testis, from here, it will descend down to the scrotum through the inguinal canal. If it's female, it will remain in the pelvis. And we have mesonephric duct here. And we have one more duct for the female development of female internal genital tract, that's paramesonephric duct or the Mullerian duct, that's uh, on side of, uh, that's inside of uh, mesonephric duct. 
So uh, one more uh, point to understand that. Yes, it's the Y chromosome contains testis determining factor that helps in the induction of gonads into testis. And the absence of Y chromosome will lead to the absence of testis determining factor and the gonads, these undifferentiated gonads will turn to ovaries, but that's not sufficient. There is something called the primordial germ cells that's in the yolk sac that has to travel all the way through this umbilical cord aligned to its hindgut and go through the bloodstream to induce these undifferentiated gonads into either testes or ovaries. If for some reason this primordial germ cells from the yolk sac will not migrate its way uh, to the gonadal regions, then these gonads will remain undifferentiated. So if these cells, primordial germ cells from the yolk sac, could not migrate and in induce the, the differentiation of gonads, undifferentiated gonads into testis or ovary, this will not be differentiated. This will there will neither be testis nor ovary. There will be absence of gonads, regardless of whether XX chromosome or XY chromosome. And other thing is same, this is gonads. Uh, in near to the gonads, we have mesonephros and the duct associated with mesonephris is the mesonephric duct. We, we said that the duct that is near the mesonephric duct is the paramesonephric duct. So we have undifferentiated gonads. Here we have mesonephric duct and we have paramesonephric duct. So that's near the mesonephric duct. Paramesonephric duct or Mullerian duct is give rise to female internal genital tract, where the mesonephric duct give rise to the male internal genital tract. In the presence of Y chromosome, in the presence of a testis determining factor, uh, these undifferentiated gonads will differentiate into ovaries. We'll have ovary in the absence of Y chromosome. If Y chromosome are present, this uh, gonad will differentiate into testes, and uh, the male internal genital tract will develop from the structure called Wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct. In female, the Wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct will degenerate, and the paramesonephric duct will persist, and that will give rise to the female internal genital structures, like we we'll already discussed, oviduct or the fallopian tube, and we have uterus and cervix, vagina, upper one third of the vagina. So that gives rise to the uh, internal genital tract, but then we have what gives rise to the external genital tract. External genital tract is developed from different structures like genital tubercle. We have genital tubercle here, urogenital sinus, urogenital poles. So these structures give rise to different female structures. Genital tubercle, in case of female, it gives rise to glans clitoris, but in case of, uh, in case of male, it gives rise to glans penis. And we have urogenital sinus. How does this urogenital sinus develop? Urogenital sinus is actually, uh, we look at this structure, we have cloaca here. This cloaca is divided into two parts. Uh, the uh, ventral part or the anterior part divides into, forms the urogenital sinus, an opening called the urogenital sinus, and the posterior part will form the anus. So we have that here. Uh, we have urogenital sinus, and the posteriorly we have anus, which is actually the division of the cloaca. And the urogenital sinus forms lower two thirds of the vagina, upper one third of the vagina forms from uh, Mullerian duct, but the up, uh, lower two thirds of the vagina comes from urogenital sinus. And this urogenital sinus also gives rise to glands like a Bartholin gland. And um, a we have urogenital fold as well. And the urogenital fold gives rise to other structures like uh, urogenital folds give rise to labia minora. Urea, urogenital folds give rise to labia minora. And urogenital sinus give rise to the vagina and the glands like periurethral glands and the Bartholin glands. In case of male, the urogenital sinus give rise to prostate glands. And the genital tubercle in case of female give rise to clitoris. In case of male, it gives rise to penis. And we have something called the labia scrotal swelling. Labia scrotal swelling gives rise to labia majora. We have labia scrotal swelling. This gives rise to labia majora. Again, the same structure, the external genital tract. We have genital tubercle that gives rise to clitoris. We have zero genital sinus that gives rise to lower two thirds of the vagina and different glands, Bartholin glands. And we have the uh, urethral fold or the urogenital fold that gives rise to uh, that gives rise to labia minora. And then we have labia scrotal swelling. In case of male, it gives rise to scrotum, and if it's female, it will give rise to labia majora. So this is the external genital tract. Uh, in front of the pubis, we have fatty layer that's called the mons pubis. It contains uh, hair, that's the mons pubis. And we have clitoris here that comes from uh, genital tubercle. And we have labia majora that comes from urogenital, sorry, labia majora comes from uh, labia scrotal soiling. In case of male, it will give rise to uh, scrotum, but if it's female, it, there will be labia majora. It's the hairy portion. Uh, inside the labia majora, this portion, this is called the labia minora that's uh, devoid of hair that does not contain hair. And we have a vagina and the urethral opening. This is the external genital tract. Uh, we talked about the fusion of the Mullerian duct uh, that gives rise to 
So the development of uh, female intelligence and tract like uterus, cervix, and the oviduct of the fallopian tube. But if for some reason there is uh, some disturbance in the fusion of this mullerian duct, two mullerian duct has to come down and they have to fuse to form the intelligence and tract. If for some reason they could not fuse properly, then there will be, there will be some congenital anomalies. So we see here two mullerian duct come down and fuse. We have urogenital sinus here. And muller induct, urogenital sinus give rise to lower two third of the vagina, and the muller induct give rise to upper one third of the vagina. Uh, and during fusion of this two duct, there is a uterine septum, and this uterine septum has to resolve to form the lumen of the uterus. And we have uh, this structure will give rise to fallopian tube or the uterine tube. And in the urogenital sinus and this portion of the muller induct are the paramesonectric duct, these structures will undergo vacuolation or the opening and the cavitations that will give rise to vaginal canal. And this is how the lumen of the uterus and the vaginal canal develops. But if for some reason this septum, this, if this septum does not resolve for some reason, then there will be septic uterus. This will give rise to septic uterus. And the lower portion of the cervix, we have, we have the uterine lumen here, and uh, we have internal, internal os, external os, and here we have the cervix. Part of the cervix is inside the vagina, and it divides the vagina into the fornixes, anterior fornix, and the posterior fornix. Uh, they are clinically important. We'll discuss a bit uh, later. Uh, so here is the congenital anomaly that can arise as the result of abnormal fusion of the molar induct. This is what a normal uterus will look like if they fuse normally and everything goes uh, normal. But if during the fusion there is incomplete resorption of the septum, we see here that uh, the septum is formed and this septum has, uh, has to go resorption. If for some reason the septum do not resolve, uh, they do not undergo resorption, then there will be the presence of septic uterus. If this two molar induct this two molar induct, if these two molar induct do not fuse completely, if they fuse at some portion and do not fuse completely, uh, undergo complete fusion, incomplete fusion will result in the bicornuate uterus. Bicornuate means two coronate, we have two coronate uterus, but they opens into a single vagina, bicornuate uterus. And if for some reason these two molar induct do not fuse at all, if they do not fuse at all, then the molar induct will give rise to what we call uterus, and the vagina will have two different uterus, two different vaginal openings. And there is the imaging uh, of the septate uterus. There is incomplete resorption of the septum that results in the septate uterus, bicornuate uterus. If there are uh, in duct incomplete resolved and uh, uterine diadelphis are the double uterus, if the in duct do not fuse at all, there will be two different uterus. This is how the descent of the testes occur. Uh, uh, why get this picture is to show the analogy between male and female uh, genetic tract development. If this, uh, we see the gonads here, if this was uh, a male, this will develop into a testis. But un if this is a female, this will develop into ovary. If Let's suppose this gonad is undifferentiated. So undifferentiated gonads can either from testis or ovary. And we said that uh, the testis in the earlier life was in close proximity to the kidney. And we know that kidney is a retroperitoneal structure. So this means that this uh, gonad was outside the peritoneum in, at some point in life. So from here, from here, this testis has to descend all the way down the, uh, down the inguinal canal to the scrotum if it's a male. But if it's a female, then this testis, the, uh, the gonad will not descend to the scrotum, it will just remain in the pelvis. So what I want to show is that the gonads, what will be testis in the male will become ovary in female. And the structure that will guide testis to the scrotum is called the caudal genital ligament. And the caudal genital ligament in uh, male will give rise to guvernaculum, but this caudal genital ligament uh, in female will give rise to something that we call the round ligament of uterus. The round ligament of uterus will connect the uterus to the labia majora, labia scrotal swelling. This will give rise to scrotum in the case of male, and it will give rise to labia majora if it's a female. So this structure will connect uh, uterus and the labia majora, and upper portion of the caudal genital ligament will give rise to what we call the round ligament of ovary. So this is just to show the analogy between what happens and what goes through the inguinal canal. This again, the same structures, muller induct fuse, and uh, we have this caudal genital ligaments that gives to right ligament of uh, round ligament of ovary and the round ligament of uterus in case of female. If it was a male, then this structure will have passed through the inguinal canal and the testis would uh, be sent all the way down to the scrotum. But if it's a female, this will not uh, be in the inguinal canal, and uh, the structures that will be in the inguinal canal will be the round ligament of uterus. So we talked about the furnaces earlier here. We see the development of two furnaces. Why this furnaces is important is because if you look at the adult anatomy, 
the angle between vagina and uterus is much straight. We have to take about 90 degree turn to reach from vagina to the uterus. There is an angle between the vagina and the angle of the cervix that's called the angle of version, which is around 90 degree. And there is also the angle between cervix, angle of the cervix and the angle of the uterus. That's around 125 degree, that's called the angle of flexion. Since this angle is not straight, and uh, we share this peritoneal lining in the back, in the sagittal sections, this uh, sagittal sections, this peritoneal lining comes down the rectum and it goes up the uterus and then it comes down the uterus and it goes over the bladder and then it's turned up. So as the peritoneum does that, it comes to pouches. And the pouch that's between the rectum and the uterus is the uterine rectum pouch or the pouch of Douglas and the pulse that's in between bladder and the uterus is called the basic uterine and pulse. This is clinically important because rectouterine uterine pulse or the pulse of Douglas is one of the lowest part in the female pelvis. And if the fluid is located, if the fluid is accumulated in this peritoneal cavity, then by the virtue of gravity, it's likely to come down to the lowest point, that's the pulse of Douglas. So if fluid comes and accumulate here, then look at here, the separations between the posterior fornix and pulse of the glass. There is very small separation. The separation is not too large. It's very small. So if we insert our finger through the vagina and go straight, go straight, go straight, we'll reach to the place that's called the posterior fornix. Because to enter the uterus or the cervix, we have to take a 90 degree turn. So we, we can go to the posterior fornix. And since the separation is very small, we can palpate if the fluid is present, if the fluid is accumulated here. So that's clinically important. And other reason why it's clinically important is because if some person is trying to do suction curatives and wants to uh, reach the uterus, then he has to know the anatomy that uh, from the vagina, he has to take a 90 degree turn to enter to, uh, into the uterus. If for some reason, he did not take that turn and just keeps going straight, then he will reach to some the place that's called the posterior fornix. And since the separation is not too large, then he's likely to perforate this area. And uh, this can lead to the introduction of infection in the posterior pulse of Douglas and the peritoneal cavity. So we have to know the anatomy and uh, the angles that's between the vagina and the uterus. The angle is not straight, it's uh, antiverted position. The, there is an angle between vagina and the cervix, and there is an angle between cervix and the uterus. The angle between the vagina and the cervix is called the angle of antiversion, that's around 90 degrees. And the angle between cervix and the main body of uterus, that's 125 degrees, that's called the angle of flexion. Okay. So what's keep the uterus in this position, in this peculiar position, are what we call the support of uterus. They are muscular support and the mechanical support. This, uh, we'll talk about the muscular support a bit later, but let's talk about the uterine axis. We already discussed that uterus is not straight. It takes some angle turn between the, there is some angle turn between the vagina and the cervix. Uh, in this skull, the angle of like, this skull, the angle of antiversion, 90 degree. And the other axis is the long axis of the uterus and the axis of the cervix. The angle between this is, of 125 degree and this angle keeps the uterus in its position. The other thing is pubis or like a ligament. If you look at this structure, we have pubis one here and there's a ligament that's connects pubis and the cervix. That ligament is called the pubis or like a ligament. You can see it in this picture, we have cervix here, we have pubis one here and the ligament that con uh, connects the pubic bone and the cervix is called the pubis or cervical ligament that helps to hold the uterus in its position. And the other support is called the cardinal ligament. Cardinal ligament is called the transverse cervical ligament. This is the sagittal section, so we can see the cardinal ligament here. But if you look at these sections, then uh, we have cervix here and uh, transverse cervical ligament or the cardinal ligaments connects the cervix to the uh, transverse wall, transverse pelvic wall, lateral pelvic wall. This ligament is called the cardinal ligament that helps to keep the uterus in its position. The other structure is called the uterosacral ligament. We have uterus here and we have sacrum here, sacrum and the coccyx bone here. So the structure that contains, connects uterus and the sacrum is called the uterosacral ligament. We can see this in this picture here, uterus and we have sacrum here. So the ligament is called the uterosacral ligament that connects uterus in its position. And we have something called the round ligament of uterus. When we talked about uh, development earlier, what goes through the inguinal canal in main, male is the Guvernaculum uh, and the structures associated with this, this, this gonads itself goes down the inguinal canal and it carries the vessels associated with it. But in case of female, these structures do not go down and what remains in the inguinal canal is this rounding point of uterus that connects the uterine fundus, anterior part of the uterine fundus to the labia majora. This is the where we have round ligament of uterus. Uh, we do not see it in this picture. Okay, also one picture, okay, here. We see, this structure that connects the inner part of the uterine fundus, uh, this goes through the inguinal canal and then it connects the uh, labia majora. This 
structure is called the round ligament of uterus. And the other support is called the broad ligament. Broad ligament is nothing but this peritoneal folding that goes around the uterus and cover all its structures here. This fallopian tube, ovary, these are all below the peritoneum. This is peritoneal cavity and this structure is uterus, ovary, fallopian tube. These are below the peritoneum. These structures are called subperitoneal structures. And um, broad ligament is nothing but this fold of peritoneum. And we have muscular support as well. Muscular support includes pelvic diaphragm and uh, levator ani muscles, we see here. These are the levator ani muscles, three sets of muscles, puborectalis, uh, pubococcygeous muscles, and the iliococcygeous muscles. These are uh, called, together called the levator ani muscles, and this helps to hold the uterus in this position. This provides muscular support to the uterus in this position. If for some reason, if for some reason the support of the uterus is lost, then there will be prolapse of the uterus, there can be prolapse of the uterus, the uterus will no longer stay in its position and it will be on the same axis as the vagina is and there is chance of prolapse of the uterus. Well, what makes the support weak uh, can be something like obesity or the multiple gestations, it can make the support weak and there is chance of prolapse of the uterus. So we have a broad ligament, something called the broad ligament, that's the fold of peritoneum that was going around uh, over the uterus, fallopian tube and the ovaries, if we see in this picture, uh, the fold of peritoneum was going over this. So this is what we are seeing. Let's suppose we are where the rectum is and being the uterus from there, from the behind. So this picture is what it looks like. They were seeing the uterus from the behind. So these are the fold of peritoneum that's over the uterus and this structure as whole is called the broad ligament. What's covered this is called the broad ligament. This provides support to the uterus. Broad ligament is self divided into three parts called mesometrium. That's over the, that's the mesothelial lining of the, of the broad ligament over the uterus. We have mesosalpings in the, the lining in the fallopian tube. We have mesovarium in the ovary. These are the structures, the structures of the broad ligament that supports the uterus and all its associated structures in its position. And the other things to notice is that we have a ureter that goes below the broad ligament or through the mesentery. And let's look at the anatomy. Okay, just one second. Mm. Okay. We see that the bladder is ahead of, in front of uh, uterus, but we know that kidney is uh, somewhere around here. It's a retroperitoneal structure somewhere around here. So the ureter has to come all the way down here and it has to read the bladder. So it has to come from back and it has to go front. But if we see the vascular supply here, then the uterine artery, uterine artery goes through the same structures and supplies the uterus. Ureter goes, the ureter goes to the bladder to, uh, for the uh, flow of urine and uterine arteries supplies the uterus. What the anatomy that we need to understand is that the uterine uh, ureter goes from back of the ure uterus to the front where we have urinary bladder. And the uterus gets its blood supply from a branch of internal iliac artery, that's the uterine artery that comes uh, somewhere in the angle that's 90 degree to the ureter. Here in this uh, transverse cervical ligament, cardinal ligament, we have uterine artery. This supplies to the uterus. This gives branches and supplies to the uterus. And here we have ureter. But the clinical importance of knowing this anatomy is that if we are undergoing hysterectomy, if we are removing a uh, uterus for some reasons, then we have to ligate the uterine artery to prevent the bleeding. And we know that uterine artery and ureter are in close proximity and they are at an angle somewhere around 90 degree. So if we ligate in the process of ligating uterine artery, we may uh, accidentally ligate the ureter. And if we do so, there will be blockage of the flow of urine and that will lead to different kinds of complications related to kidney. So we have to be very conscious about this anatomy that uterine artery and the ureter are in close proximity and uh, ureter is actually below the uterine artery. There's a mnemonic called water under the breeze. Uh, so ureter, Uterine artery goes above the ureter in that angle somewhere around 90 degree, and the ureter goes below the uterine artery to front of ure uterus to supply the urinary blood. Ovary is held in this position by the help of ovarian ligament that connects ovaries to the uterus, and ovary gets its supply from the ovarian artery that comes uh, through suspensory ligament of the ovary. The suspensory ligament of the ovary connects ovary to the uh, aorta and the inferior vena cava. And fallopian tube gets its uh, blood supply from the ovarian artery that is coming through the suspensory ligament supplying the ovary, but it also gives branches to the fallopian tube. And a part of the ovarian artery also gives supplies to the uterus. 
uterus gate is blood supply from uterine artery that comes from cervical ligament. You have to be very conscious about the anatomy of the uh, ureter and uh, ureter and the uterine artery. We may ligate the uh, ureter artery during hysterectomy and that will cause uh, nephrological problems. And uh, vaginal is supplied by the vaginal artery, which is also the branch of the internal iliac artery. And there is the rich anastomosis between ovarian artery, uterine artery, and the vaginal artery. This is the same structure. We're just uh, wing from anterior. This was from the back. This was from the front. This is the frontal section of the uterus. So uterus has fundus. This is the part that's palpable. And we have the main body. And we have cervix, internal os, external os. And um, the internal layer of the uterus is called the endometrium. This is the layer that proliferates and sets during menstruation. We have myometrium. This is the muscular layer. That's the contractile layer of the uterus. And then we have the epimetrium and the perimetrium. Fallopian tube is divided into four parts mainly that's called the infundibulum that contains fimbriated structures this fimbriated structure what it does is when the ovary releases its secondary oocytes in the baby the cavity the ciliated structures drain or the pull the secondary oocytes into the fallopian tube and it will uh, helps to drive this fallopian, secondary oocytes inside the fallopian tube and all the way to the ampulla where the fertilization is most likely to occur ampulla is the longest and the, the widest part of the uh, part of the fallopian tube where fertilization is most likely to occur. The other part of the fallopian tube is called the isthmus, and we have the uterine part of the fallopian tube. A part of the cervix comes down to the vagina and defends it. It uh, separates the vagina into anterior and the posterior fornix. We discussed about the clinical importance of that earlier. Um, the other things to understand here is that these structures, uterus and fallopian tube, these add come from structures that's called mullerian duct. And the upper one third of the vagina also come from mullerian duct, but the lower two thirds of the vagina come from urogenital sinus. So these structures, uterus, fallopian tube, and uh, upper one third of the vagina initially, upper one third of the vagina initially were lined by columnar epithelium, but the lower two thirds of the vagina is initially lined by squamous epithelium. Later on in life, the squamous epithelium replaces that columnar upper one third columnar epithelium of the vagina and the whole vagina will be lined by the squamous epithelium non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium if for some reason if for some reason the columnar epithelium of the upper one third of the vagina persists and it is not replaced by uh, squamous epithelium then the condition is called vaginal adenosis and this increases the risk of vaginal cancer and we talked that uh, uh, this uh, uterus and fallopian tube are lined by the columnar epithelium and the lower two thirds of the vagina is lined by squamous epithelium which will re eventually replace the upper one third of the vagina also and this will also be lined by the squamous epithelium uh, the endocervix is lined by endocervix is lined by columnar epithelium and the exocervix is lined by squamous epithelium the difference between uh, the transition between squamous and columnar epithelium is so sharp that and there is, there is something called the squam or columnar junction. This is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that lines the uh, exocervix, and we have the columnar epithelium that lines the endocervix. The reason this is clinically important is that suppose this is the cervical canal, and uh, for, for some time, let's ignore this structure and uh, focus on these dotted blue structures. If this is endocervix, and if this is exocervix, then you can say that this exocervix is lined by stratified squamous epithelium, this line by squamous epithelium, and the area inside the dotted blue circle is lined by columnar epithelium. So we have squamous epithelium here, columnar epithelium here. So this junction is very sharp. This junction is called the squamous columnar junction. But this uh, columnar epithelium, the columnar epithelium in the endocervix has the potential to undergo metaplasia and converts itself into squamous epithelium. So the Mm, columnar epithelium inside of the blue, blue dotted circle can undergo metaplasia to squamous epithelium. And if they undergo metaplasia to the squamous epithelium, then the structure inside this also will have squamous epithelium. Let's imagine the structures from here on, it starts to undergo metaplasia, 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 metaplasia. So until here, the structures inside of this blue circle, this small blue circle has not undergone metaplasia. So that means this structure inside of this blue circle still has the columnar epithelium, but now the structure which initially had the columnar epithelium now has squamous epithelium. So this blue dot structure was our old squamous columnar junction, but since it has undergone metaplasia, and uh, here we have now the newly we have squamous epithelium here as well, and the columnar epithelium here. So this is the new squamous columnar junction. So we have old squamous columnar junction, we have new squamous columnar junction, and the area that's in between them is called the transformation zone. 
The reason that I'm trying to emphasize this transformation zone so much is that because this is the reason where the cervical cancer is most likely to occur in the transformation zone. Cervical cancer are likely to occur in the transformation zone. So we talked about the column junction. Let's uh, talk about the blood vessels, blood supply to the uterus. Uterus is supplied by uterine artery, and uterine artery is the branch of internal iliac artery. We have abdominal aorta in the rectoperitoneum. Abdominal aorta give rise to two branches, that's two common iliac artery. Common iliac artery differentiates our branches into external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. Internal iliac artery is still divides into anterior branch and the posterior branch. And the anterior branch of the uterine artery, uh, internal iliac artery, give rise to a different branch, one of which is uterine artery that supplies the uterus. The anterior branch of the um, internal iliac artery also give rise to vaginal artery. It also give rise to medial rectal artery. It gives rise to different structure, but the uterine artery, we need to understand that it's the branch of the internal iliac artery, particularly anterior division of the internal iliac artery. We discussed earlier that uterus is supplied by the uterine artery and again, ureter. Ureter goes under the uterine artery from back to the front where we have a urinary bladder and uh, we can see that the angle between them is almost around 90 degree. And during hysterectomy, when we ligate uterine artery, we may ligate ureter as well. So this particular anatomy is important. We should not be ligating the ureter. We should be very careful about this. Uh, the reason this picture, I kept this picture is to show the anastomosis, the rich anastomosis that's there. From the suspensory ligaments, the ovary gets the ovarian artery, and the ovarian artery not only supplies the ovary, but also part of the, the fallopian tube, and also supplies uh, some part of the uterus. And um, uterine artery supplies the uterus, and also the vaginal artery. The vaginal artery also supplies the uterus, and there is the rich anastomosis. So during hysterectomy, even if we ligate uterine artery, the uterus or the structures that's there, that they can still get the blood supply from these anastomosis. This is just the branches of the uh, iliac artery that we have talked. The internal iliac artery gives rise to entry and the posterior division. And we talked uh, earlier here, uh, aorta, common iliac, external iliac, internal iliac, anterior division, posterior division. So it's the same structure. If the internal iliac gives rise to entry and the posterior division. And the posterior division still divides to give, we talked about the uterine artery, uh, vaginal artery, and the middle, uh, middle rectal artery, but it, is, it gives rise to other branches as well. So we can looking from the superior view, uh, the same structures from the different view. So we have ureter, okay, sorry, uterus here, uterus, and we have uh, these structures. Uh, they first follow this peritoneum, lining peritoneum. This peritoneum goes like this. They follow the curve. So the aorta is beside the behind the peritoneum. So it's the retroperitoneum structure, and all these structures are below the peritoneum, and they are called the subperitoneum structures. So we have uterus that not at the angle that's not uh, that's not at the straight angle to the vagina if we think that the vagina is at back of the screen you are um, back of the screen then the uterus is bent at some angle so it's not straight there is the peculiar position of the uterus and uh, from the uterus we have the fallopian tube fallopian tubes are, uh, and uh, here is the ovary the ovary is attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament and ovary gets its blood supply from the ovarian artery which comes through the Suspensory ligament of the ovary. This suspensory ligaments of the ovary connects the ovary to the aorta and the inferior vena cava. This ovary and the inferior vena cava, this independently gives ovarian artery. The ovarian artery is not the branch of internal iliac artery, but rather the branch of the aorta itself. So aorta gives rise to the ovarian artery that goes from the suspensory ligament of the ovary. It supplies the ovary as well as a part of the fallopian tube and the uterus. And while talking about the support of uterus, we talked about the broad ligament and the mesometrium, mesoverium, mesosalpings. We talked about the round ligament. So here is the entry part of the fundus, and we have the round ligament that goes through the inguinal canal. Inguinal canal. Here we have the round ligament that goes through the inguinal canal, and it joins the labia majora. Okay. Now let's go to the ovary. Ovary is the female gonads, and um, whose begins in female. In, in utero inside the uterus itself, uh, but they get arrested in the process first, the meiosis first. So there are lots of uh, immature primary oocytes and number of primordial follicles. The primordial follicles are lined by single layer of flat epithelium. And uh, during puberty, there is pulsatile release of GNRS that uh, stimulates the secretion of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that helps in the development of these follicles into uh, primary follicles, secondary follicles, uh, and the mature follicle, graphene follicles. So primary follicles are lined by uh, cubital epitheliums, and this keeps uh, lining with uh, multiple layer of epithelium. 
And eventually there will be the development of the cavity or the antrum in the secondary follicles. We call this antral follicle, and this matures to form the graphene follicle. The graphene follicle contains the uh, oocytes, which is lined by granulosa cells, uh, which is in close proximity to the oocytes. And then we have the theca cells. So when the follicular stimulating hormone is released, it acts on and granulosa cells, follicular stimulating hormone acts on the granulosa cell. It helps in the production of estrogen, that's estradiol. Estradiol produces, you know, estradiol is produced, and um, the estradiol gives, uh, estradiol levels keep increasing, 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 and it will give the negative feedback to the LS and FSH. So the uh, FSH, the positive secretion of FSH LS that leads to the production of estrogen, pops down the production of LS FSH that leads to the proliferation of uterus. We look at this uh, cycle, this will probably make it uh, better clear. Uh, developing follicles undergo maturation. There's a pulsatile secretion of the F cells and the LS, the LS secretion is transient increase that leads to the production and increased production of the estrogen. Estrogen production as it goes increasing, 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 there's the proliferation of the uh, endometrium. The endometrium keeps proliferating. And um, what this does is when the level of estrogen increases, the estrogen gives negative feedback to the uh, uh, pituitary for the inhibition of the secretion of the FSH and LS. And when the level of estrogen is increasing, the level of the FSH and LS are decreasing. But before few days before ovulation, that negative feedback changes. The, the level of estrogen crosses a certain threshold and that feedback uh, is now no longer negative. The estrogen rather gives positive feedback. And when the level of estrogen is increasing, there is the surge of the FSH and the LS, particularly LS surge. And this, the surge of the LS hormone, is what causes the ovulation to occur. When the level of LS hormone, um, when the LS occurs, then after that, uh, there will be rupture of the follicles, uh, there will be release of the primary oocytes, and what remains inside the uh, ovary and follicles that are granulosa cells and theca cells, they turn themselves into corpus luteum, and uh, corpus luteum will secrete estrogen and progesterone. So here, uh, the level of uh, estrogen and progesterone had transiently decreased after ovulation, but after the formation of corpus luteum, the levels of estrogen and progesterone transient increase, particularly progesterone. And progesterone uh, uh, does not uh, uh, help in the proliferation of uterus. It uh, actually uh, prepares the uterus for the uh, gestation. It's called progestin because it's called progesterone because it is a progestational hormone. It's not anti-gestational, it's progestational. So it helps in gestation. So it's a progestin. So it helps in the gestations during the uh, secret phase, uh, there will be preparation of the uterus for the gestation. There will be vascular supply, increasing the vascular supply, coiling of the arteries, spiral arteries will be formed, and uh, it prepares for the um, gestation. If for some reason fertilization does not take place, then the corpus luteum will degenerate, and there will be formation of corpus albicans, and uh, the level of estrogen and progesterone will fall down. And after this fall down, there will be setting of the uh, endometrium, the stratum functionalis layer, the vessel layer will remain intact. We have the vessel layer here and the functionalis layer here. The vessel layer will remain intact. The vessel layer are the stem cells. The vessel layer contains the stem cells of the uterus that will um, further helps in the proliferation of the uterus again in the follicular phase when it comes back to the phase again. The um, vessel layer will give rise to the cells of the endometrium again. The cycle will continue. So the loss of progesterone support uh, causes the setting of the stratum functionalis layer of the endometrium and there will be menstrual bleeding. And we have this picture just to show the blood supply, um, blood supply of the ovary. Uh, okay, look at here. Ovary supplied by the ovary and artery. We talked about uterus. Uterus was supplied by the branch of the common iliac, uh, common iliac artery give rise to external and iliac artery, internal iliac artery. The entire division of the internal iliac artery give rise to uterine branch that supplies the uterus. But ovary and artery is not supplied by the branch of the uh, iliac artery, as it's supplied by the branch of the aorta itself. The uh, aorta give rise to ovary and artery that comes down to the suspensory ligament of the ovary and it supplies the ovary. So in the both sides, the ovary and artery is the branch of aorta itself. But ovary and vein, the ovary drains into ovary and vein, which drains asymmetrically into sides. If this is the left side, then the left side, the ovary and vein drains to the renal vein before it drains to the inferior vena cava. But in the right side, sorry, oh yes, in the right side, in the right side, the ovary and vein drains directly into the inferior vena cava. We can see two differences: ovary and vein drains to the inferior vena cava in the right side, but is on the left side, ovary and vein drains to the uh, renal vein and the adrenal vein also drain to the renal vein before they drain to the inferior vena cava. So there is difference in the blood supply. And this is the basic anatomy and the physiology of uh, a female reproductive system. 
So let's get back to our uh, initial question. Uh, the, there was a kid with uh, 45 chromosomes. He had only one X chromosome and there was not another uh, X or another Y chromosome. So what will be the sex? What will be the sex of this child? This child is likely to be born with Turner syndrome. So what will be the sex of this child? Will he be a boy or will she be a female? I want uh, the participants to answer the question. It will be female. Yes, ex yes, ex yes, exactly. She will be female because, as we already discussed, that is not the presence of two X chromosome that makes female or female, but rather the absence of any Y chromosome that makes female or female. So since we do not have any Y chromosome, uh, this child will be a female. And that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Sagar Dai for this wonderful presentation. It was really informative and we learned a lot of things from this presentation. Uh, for now, I would like to call upon uh, Sobin Regnidai. Sobin Dai is one of the most loved person in Janik Medical College. He is also one of the most motivated person. Uh, Sobin Dai, the, the mic is yours. So when they also go mic off, so. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Dai. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Sobin Regmi from Janaki Medical College. I would like to thank the Sagar Pantabai for his wonderful presentation on the female reproductive organ. And would like to thank all the participants of the today's webinar for their presence uh, despite their available time. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll learn something more about the female reproductive systems from the today's webinar. The Gray Medical is the best platform or the, or for all the medical students. Uh, we have created this platform uh, with the motto of study together and the learning together. And with, uh, gradually we, have, we are changing the platform pattern of the Gray Medicals. And uh, from the next week, we have the panel discussion webinar. And we have the full and respected person as a chief guest for the panel discussion. And coming week, we have the main webinars on the gyno uh, uh, Next week, we have the web, uh, panel discussions. Uh, Dr. Konisman Bistor, sir, uh, Department of the Biochemistry UCMS. And Dr. Budhiras Tam. Budhiras, uh, I would like to invite you all for the next COVID also and you can join us join us on great medicals through the viber facebook youtube channels also and get updated and thank you now i would like to uh, present a token love token of love to our beloved uh, hey. senior Mr. Sagar Pontadai, who had, who had, who had, uh, who had given us this wonderful knowledge on the female reproductive uh, system. Thank you, Dai. And uh, this token of love is for you. And uh, I would also like uh, Sagar Pontadai to add a few words. Thank you, Dai. And thank you, the Grey Medicals team, for uh, this warm gesture of gratitude. Um, I think the best way to learn is to teach. Uh, and uh, the initiation that the Gray Medicals has taken uh, to keep students from all the medical college under one umbrella and to study together as a team 
is a really nice way to learn and to grow oneself. So all the medical students who are willing to broaden their knowledge, wants to increase their knowledge, can uh, join the Gray Medicals and at least learn something. The Gray Medicals is the main uh, aim of the Gray Medicals is also from is the transition of from learning nothing to learning something. So we will definitely be better than what we were if we join this uh, uh, team and uh, uh, attend its a seminar or webinar. We have a uh, further seminar coming um, probably some next week. And uh, those that are interested, I request all of you to please join that seminar as well and uh, keep learning. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Dai. Now, uh, I would like to end the program uh, today. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the participants. And once again, thank you so much, Sagar Pantadai, for this one of the uh, informative uh, session on the female reproductive system. Thank you, Dai. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Earlier.